the attendees, thank you for joining our webinar today. Uh, it's the fourth webinar in the series of value chain analysis webinars. Uh, and I would like first to remind you that you can uh, type your questions in the questions panel, which you will see on the GoToWebinar panel uh, open on, on the right. Uh, I'm pleased to present our today uh, panelist, Brinda Sharma, who has um, experience of 15 years working in the US, UK, and Netherlands. He's a regular speaker at public forums, and as well, he publishes articles in international tech journals. Our second panelist is Madi van der Walk. She has more than 14 years of experience in international tax and transfer prices. Uh, Ali, please start the webinar. Thanks, Maria. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. My name is Virinda Sharma, uh, and the topic for today's discussion in our uh, webinar is why is value chain analysis critical in a BEPS environment? As you would be aware that we are running a series of uh, presentations on value chain analysis uh, which has become uh, important after the rollout of uh, 15 action by the OCD in October last year and this is third in the series of value chain analysis discussions we are having uh, on webinars. So as the topic for today is to look at how value chain and why value chain analysis is critical in BAPS environment, with that topic, today, uh, today we will be covering few areas like why value chain analysis is required in today's scenario. Although we did have concepts like functional analysis, looking at people's function in the past, as we know that the OCD guidance, the detailed guidance, first time it was issued was, detailed guidance was in 1995. Then we had the second one in 2010. Now we have, uh, in 15, we have uh, detailed guidance through action 8 to 10. But we will understand today that why VCA is required after BEPS. Thereafter, we'll pick up cases which are not workable under BEPS and how value chain analysis can help in resolving issues under those situations. And we will be covering four situations which we have highlighted under uh, section two. In section three, we will pick up uh, Uber case and uh, we will look at their existing structure and we will apply value chain analysis technique and we call technique two, uh, which is technique two, uh, uh, we call that as technique two, where we follow certain methodology to use value chain analysis to address processing issues in Uber structure. Next, we will cover and cover how VCA compares with function analysis, which is a traditional approach, and we will highlight some important points there. And then we'll move on to in, in which situation do we need to apply VCA, and then we will pick up the regulatory changes uh, which are associated with VCA, like the OCD uh, guidance through that's action eight to 10 and action 13, where it, we need to disclose certain TP information and then we will look at the applicability of VCA to three layers of, uh, of documentation, which include master file, C by CR, and tax return, which is a part of tax information, which is provided to the tax inspector. And then at the end, we will pick up a few takeaways, which will follow with questions and answers. Now, the first question comes is that why VCA has become a hot topic today. VC is not a new concept. That concept has been there in other areas in, in, in company where evaluation has to be done. Even in transpressing, uh, some type of analysis was done like profit contribution analysis when a supply chain needs to be restructured. But the significance of VC has, uh, has taken a, a prime stage after the BAPS rollout by the OCD in October last year. And this is 
Also important because the disclosure requirements have increased significantly. Now we have Action 13 where the taxpayer has to provide information on its transgressing policy and setup through master file, through country by country reporting, through local files and tax return was al always there but tax return can also uh, do a cross check of what returns uh, a local entity is earning on its functionality. So all these documents are interconnected now and there are very high chance now for tax authorities to pick up loop codes if the policies are not right and value chain analysis is something which MNEs can follow to address the anomalies in their transgression policies. So, but one of the way to address the problem which we see uh, in, in transgression policy is that we conduct function analysis, check assets and check risk, which is a traditional approach. But that approach, when we look at, that is more relevant when we do one-sided benchmarks, which means that we follow OCD guidelines, which are there we have for 2010. We pick up a tested party and we say that this tested party is a cost center and we benchmark a cost plus markup and we say that our policy is right. But at the same time, the other entity, which is the recipient of, for example, of the, of the income uh, from tested party, that entity may be incurring losses because it's more like a profit center. And if we do not do a holistic analysis through value chain analysis, where we look at uh, different processes in value chain and we look at key drivers who are involved in those key drivers, which entities in the group are involved in those key drivers, then we cannot justify losses at the other end of the group, which is party to the transaction, which is a profit center, which is a principal. So VC analysis is very important to address uh, such uh, uh, anomalies in intercompany pricing. Second area which is uh, uh, getting questionable in the light of VC analysis under BEPS is IP structures which do not absorb cost, which means we have a legal owner of the IP which doesn't pay for the group entity who's developing the IP, then the only reward that IP entity should get is cost plus. Uh, and if it absorbs cost and it doesn't perform functions, then the only reward that IP entity who owns the IP and provide funds should only get a, a return related to financing the IP. So VC analysis will help in defining whether the existing IP structures are right or wrong, and then how to correct them. Third structure which we have seen, which are coming, uh, uh, which are becoming questionable is commissioner structures. And as we already have seen in action seven, that commissioner structures uh, are the kind of no-go now, and uh, they will attract permanent establishment issue. And if the pricing based with commissioners is not a arm's length, more profits will be attributable to these commissioners. So, Sophie Render, you mean here that the principal functions are merely performed by the commissioner and not so much um, by the principal, right? So, I think the, the, the fact here is that principal is performing its functions as a profit center. There are people in principal office, principal company office, but commissioners, they are also playing significant role in terms of negotiating contract with customer habitually binding the principal. So there are much more uh, uh, broad activities that are taking place at local level and, and which demand a higher level of remuneration than just paying a small commission on cost loss. And then other structures which, which are coming, uh, which are becoming questionable are geographically fragmenting IP structures where the legal owner is in one country and then the developer is in another country and then the legal owner has board of directors and they take some critical decisions in terms of they come to that country and uh, on the soil of that country they take decisions and, and the company argues that there is substance in that uh, country which owns the IP legally uh, and, uh, and they say that uh, the IP is developed by another country so that country should also get some share of residual profit but if the legal entity doesn't have people these structures will be easily 
challenged. Uh, thank you, Virender. So we, we go now to the first question about structure, one-sided benchmarks. Um, in this example, you see a distributor structure where the income for the principal and so the total profit varies significantly per year. Um, however, if you look only at the level of the group entity with the logistics center or the distributor, uh, you see just stable financials. And most likely these numbers are based on a traditional transfer pricing model and benchmarking study that was specifically performed for the activities of these group entities. So a cost plus for the logistics center and an allocation of a margin of sales revenue to the distributor. Um, the entity that is acting as the principal and is actually the matchmaker performing the value created activity can be qualified as a profit center. The principal is generating revenues or incurring losses, depending on the financial year. And clearly, from a holistic point of view, the financial situation of the entire group is different than when you would look at the logistics center or the distributor only. It can be questioned if the functions that are performed are in practice spread over the group in a different way and the logistics center and the distributor should be rewarded differently. By conducting a value chain analysis, such misalignments can be made visible. The higher the delta of the outcome of the value chain analysis compared to the actual situation, the greater the need to provide explanations to this exercise. So we saw already value chain analysis is another way of looking at your organization and identify potential mismatches in where the people and functions are located and value is created and where the profit is landing. Um, also, a, a so-called outlier analysis based on value chain analysis can also be useful in these kind of situations where you use simulations and scenarios, so conduct what-if financial simulations under key tax and transfer pricing scenarios with respect to the major type of intercompany transaction. An outlier analysis can be used to explain major inconsistencies in CYC reporting, if applicable. And also, in an outlier analysis, you can define company as well as in industry relevant ratios. And if you define which ratios are normal for the group and or the industry, as well as, as well as an outlier of what could be considered an acceptable standard deviation, you can also see how your company is doing. Maji, uh, one point which is worth noting here is that if you see that we have in this table a multi-year analysis. And in this multi-year analysis, we can see that principal, which is a profit center, has fluctuating profits, like minus 100 in one year, then positive, then minus, then positive, a big fluctuation. Right. And when I see cost center has kind of constant profits, and this is an example where they are constant, but they can be slight fluctuations. Then I see revenue center has is going up and down, and obviously revenue center could be a distributor, and the margin will go up and down depending on how much sales that distributor is generating. So when we apply value chain analysis, can we say that in this case, for example, revenue center is earning fluctuating profits and principal is earning big losses, again fluctuating, but big losses, big profit. Is that something which is which should be also attributable to to the distributor? Because distributor, if you see, it's not earning uh, so much fluctuating profit and distributor may not be a revenue center, it may be a profit center. Right. Some losses of principal or, yeah. or should move to a distributor and uh, the question is, is that how value chain analysis can help us in deciding that distributors should also be allocated some portion of losses right. or profits of yes. the principal. Yes, that's correct, Rivander. You should uh, apply it over multiple periods of years, uh, if possible, to have the most representative results uh, and outcome of the value chain analysis, and then you can uh, further investigate how the functions and so the allocation of the profits are appropriately uh, spread over the group? Absolutely right. And uh, when we apply uh, VCA principles, then a distributor might be contributing 
a lot to driving value in the value chain. That means that distributor is creating value, for example, by doing heavy marketing and selling, which means that some portion of profits of the principal yep. should lock profits and or losses should be attributable to, yep. to the revenue. And that the allocation should be way different. Absolutely. Yep. All right. We go to the to the next questionable structure without people function. Um, and that is actually the structure of Uber active in providing taxi services and this structure is visualized of uh, the, the, the potential misalignment of the Uber structure is visualized on this slide. Um, the structure uh, works as follows. An Uber driver gives a passenger a ride in one of the 60 plus countries outside the US. The customer makes an online payment for the ride which is sent to Uber. Uber will keep 20% and 80% of the fare is returned to the driver. 1% of Uber's cut of fare is kept as income at the level of Uber BV in the Netherlands. There are local Uber subsidiaries in each of the countries where Uber operates that receive money from Uber BV to fund marketing and support services. After deduction of these costs and Uber BV's cut of the fare, the remainder is paid as a royalty to Uber International CP in Bermuda. Income lending here is not taxed by the Netherlands or the US, and 1.45% of net revenue is paid as royalty for IP for intellectual property to Uber Technologies Inc. in San Francisco, which is the parent company of the entire Uber group. This structure with Uber International CV being in Bermuda without any people functions is obviously attracting criticism in the post spectrum. Value chain analysis could be of help here to either substantiate the current structure and provide older trail on the peak value drivers, creating value and their location, or align appropriate allocation of income to each of the Uber group entities. And we will look into uh, the value chain analysis of Uber in further detail later on during this webinar. Imagine when I look at Uber structures, this is not uh, sing, uh, one uh, structure we are seeing. There are many more structures like this. And why these structures have emerged over the last couple of years is because many of these companies are part of digital economy. And where, because of they being part of digital economy, it's easy to park IP in one location, right? And, uh, and when I look at this structure, it is not very difficult to find where the, where the value lies, right? If I apply a value chain analysis principle, it, it doesn't take much time to spot where the value is. Right. Is the value where yeah, the IP is owned by, for example, an entity in the US, is the value lies in supply chain, for example, in the case of Amazon. So yeah. one, one has to really apply a value chain analysis principle to spot how the legal entity in the group should be rewarded on the basis how much contribution that legal entity is making to the value chain, which yes. we will be covering in our uh, subsequent slides. Yeah, correct. We ran there and we see all the cases, not only Amazon, but Apple, who received already a tax bill, and, and Google are similar cases with uh, similar issues. Yeah. So the next example we have is uh, where we have a case of a company uh, and this group manufactures vending machines, and uh, the the technology know-how show-how for this uh, vending machine, we, and we call that as intellectual property, is owned by company B, which is the legal owner. The Dempy function behind this intellectual property this technology, and Dempy when we say Dempy, which means development, enhancement, maintenance protection and exploitation of the IP, which is technology know or show how, uh, is done by parent company. Uh, and the development function is outsourced to uh, contract research organization, which are the legal entities who are doing research and development for this intellectual property, but managed by parent company. And operating companies, they use this intellectual property to sell machines to customers. Now, in this whole arrangement, if you see that the key role is 
played by parent company as the owner of the IP, as the economic owner of the IP. They, of course, are more like profit centers. Uh, they talk to customers, they develop relationships. In some cases, they even own customer lists and they sell machines to their customers. Now, in this example, operating company gives royalty to parent company and then parent company uh, shares some portion of royalty with company B as the legal owner. Now, if we do a value chain analysis, we can easily find that the key value drivers to the value chain are performed by the parent company through Dempsey functions and more like an investment center. Uh, and it's all also managing all these functions and risk around the IP. And operating companies, they're also creating value by developing relationships with customers because if they do not perform well, if they do not negotiate well, if they do not market their machines well uh, to the customers, they will cannot generate business. So when we apply value chain analysis principle, the, the residual profit in the value chain should be allocated to the parent company and the operating company. Company B, the legal owner of the intellectual property, should only get a routine return if company B is only owning the intellectual property and if it's not funding it, then company B should only get a cost plus return for few people who are there on company B payroll who are protecting the IP, who are uh, getting the IP registered in different countries as per local laws. That's it. But if company B is also funding the intellectual property uh, through providing money, then the return should be limited to the financing uh, cost which is incurred by company B. No return should be given to company B beyond that. So value chain analysis by, dissects the company value chain and finds the value drivers and on the basis of that, the portion of profits are allocated to different entities in the group. Yes, this is render this moment. How did this company get the IP in the first place? Uh, it's a very good question because uh, uh, one way company can have uh, company B as a legal IP is transfer the IP. But when you do it, there are some challenges in terms of uh, exit charge, capital gain tax. But these type of structures I have seen in those cases where parent will be in the U.S., uh, legal owner will be in Malta, and the IP is there because some acquisition happened, and then the IP moves to company B because acquisition is there, uh, and the, the, the cost of that IP is in the books of or in the financials of company B, which has to be amortized over the period, but that's it. So in that case, the IP is acquired by company B, uh, and if no further development is done by company B, I would imagine that in those cases, the royalty rate will be limited to the extent the value which is carried by that IP existing IP, which is owned by company B, yeah. which means that company B has invested on it, there is a certain level of risk, and if uh, the money is blocked on that IP acquisition, so the reward should be limited to that, and if all that enhancement development is happening at in comp parent company, then the, the major portion of the residual profit will go to the parent company. Okay. Next example, we have uh, commissioner structure, and these were uh, uh, commission structures were one of the, the most soft structures uh, in the past, and uh, we have seen uh, uh, these were typical structure where company can uh, uh, manage the sale of their products in local territory. And uh, commissioner was uh, able to take uh, a flash title of the product. Uh, now, in the light of action seven, all these structures are under attack, which means that if we have commissioner structure where uh, they are habitually uh, concluding contracts, uh, they easily form permanent establishment of the principal in, in the local country. And uh, if the commissioner is not rewarded appropriately for its functions, profits of the principal will be attributable to, to commissioner. Now the question here comes is that we have clients who have, uh, which have uh, commissioner structures already in place, 
Now, can we have a kind of a blocker, or we, we call that as a PE blocker or permanent establishment blocker? Can we build that where we can protect these structures, for example, by changing the name of commissioner to, say, marketing or selling entity, or changing the name of the commission agreement to, say, distribu distribution agreement? If we do that, can that protect the commissioner uh, from forming a PE in the local territory? Uh, answer is no, because now the things are driven by people function. If commissioner doesn't, uh, if commissioner has people function, if they're taking critical decisions, then it's very clear that commissioner is not uh, uh, more like an agent. It's not like an agent. Commissioner is taking uh, much more wider functions. It's more closer to a full risk distributor, except it's not taking inventory on its books. It's managing a lot of positions in the local territory, and accordingly, the returns which will go to commissioner will be very high. And, and that is why the m &E needs to uh, be careful to check that what are the KPIs or key performance indicators of the people on commissioner payroll. Are their KPIs, are, are they related to how much sales they are generating? Is their bonus linked to their sales? What level of negotiations are they doing in local territory? What job titles they carry? So all these things have become very important. And when we apply value chain analysis, we could find that commissioners are adding great value in the value chain. And accordingly, their reward should be much, much higher than what they're getting a cost plus return in this example. Uh, next example we have is Uber, which my colleague uh, Margie shared in previous in one of the previous slides. And here we are trying to apply a value chain analysis uh, on Uber to find that how value chain analysis can help us in finding which entity in the group should get what level of reward. Now. When we see this diagram, we can easily uh, spot that the intellectual property was developed in the US, IT platform was developed in the US, and there are significant people function which is happening in the US. And we also have Uber sales and marketing subsidies which are in, in Europe. They are doing marketing and selling, establishing network, because when we look at the Uber model, technology platform is very important, no doubt. But at the same time, the network, yeah. which is the network of uh, taxi drivers and and customers, which are associated to the network, they together form a, a very important part of the value chain. So if, in this case, Uber sales and marketing subsidies, they are adding a high value in the value chain in, in terms of developing and helping developing that network and Uber USA is developing that IT platform. So when we apply value chain analysis principles, we can clearly see that the key value drivers are at the level of subsidies, marketing selling subsidies, at the level of Uber US, USA and Uber BB, we would consider more as a, a kind of a intermediary where it's uh, 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 collecting uh, funds or uh, collecting money from the uh, from the uh, from the driver from the customers, and then the royalty is paid uh, paid by uh, Uber International CV to Uber USA. So I will look at Uber BB and Uber International CV more as routine players. So their reward should be limited to their functionality. It should there should be more like call center or and to a very less extent revenue center and major share of the residual profit should go to USA and sales and marketing subsidies depending upon how much level of significant people functions uh, they are carrying. So when I look at Uber model, the key value drivers of Uber model will be the IT platform on which uh, uh, people have a connection to that application they access that application, which is, it is based on software coding. And then that IT platform is very valuable. The network, which is taxi drivers and customers, that's also very valuable. And the third element, which is also very valuable and key value driver is 
managing relationship with regulatory authorities. And we already seen that there are some challenges already happening in certain countries. In, in some countries, uh, uh, legal authorities, they've already given judgment. So if the local entity is not being able to manage uh, the local issues uh, properly, then there will be a big regulatory ch challenges and that's a very important driver of the business in the value chain. So this is a typical approach we apply uh, where we we find that how should we allocate what level of profit. So in, th in this approach we call technique two where we first find what's the EBIT margin in the value chain. And once we have the EBIT margin in the value chain, the, the, the routine plays are rewarded on the basis of cost plus, on the basis of revenue. And then we say we give cost plus to routine players if uh, if we follow traditional approach uh, in transfer pricing, we benchmark cost plus and then we say that, that is a down step. In value chain analysis, we also perform uh, a further step where we check that whether that cost center, is that cost center adding any value to the value chain? Is this cost center inefficient? If it is, then it's not the question of market. Even the cost can be challenged uh, in the value chain analysis. So once we have rewarded these uh, routine players, then we have a residual profit. And this residual profit will be divided between the investment center and profit center. In our case, uh, we can say that investment center is in the US, which developed the IT, which owns the IT, which is platform. And uh, we can say that profit center uh, is Uber marketing and selling entities in, in Europe to the extent they have significant people function. So uh, we will uh, have to uh, allocate profits between investment center and profit center on the basis of uh, uh, reasonable allocation. Thank you, Virendra. Um, today, corporate governance is also very important. It is very important that the decision-making processes and the approval policy do reflect the operating model of a company. Also, the legal framework needs to be aligned. We see in practice several cases where directors and staff members will wear multiple hats in the decision-making process or act not from places where they are supposed to be located and are acting in different roles with one and the same job title and email address. To mention just a few practical points. This impacts directly the operating model and the tax and transfer pricing model as a result. For example, when there are more functions attributed to a, to a LRD in practice, and it could, it could be considered a mere distributor in fact, this impacts directly the level of compensation that is appropriate. Another example is that value chain analysis looks as well at the impact of the economic circumstances. Economic circumstances may create opportunities to capture profits in excess of what the market would otherwise allow and whether such value creation is sustainable. For example, uh, whether market advantages are protected due to barriers to entry the market to potential competitors or the impact of valuable intangibles. Um, this also refers back to the industry analysis, which is part of the value chain analysis. MEs will need to conduct an analysis of the value chain and people functions annually to prepare the CYC reporting and support the other annual filings. Access to global information through CYC reporting means that tax authorities can target MEs where they perceive a lack of substance or loss of tax revenue. So, in case of non alignment of CYC reporting, transfer pricing documentation, and tax returns. This all means that MEs should align tax returns and the local transfer pricing files and forms and CBC reporting. Um, they should focus on this uh, this year in particular to ensure that all, all documentation tells a consistent story. And this, this also means that tax departments need to adjust and clarify identical rules and responsibilities for global tax files to support the new annual reporting requirements. We also will render will also get back on this in a later slide. And, and this slide uh, shows that the transition 
as a result of the BEPS project from the traditional pre-BEPS functional analysis to the post-BEPS value chain analysis. And there, uh, rather than the economic, financial, and legal reality, the real operating model and corporate governance, according to uh, value chain analysis outcomes, uh, should be aligned with the tax and transfer pricing model. Raji, uh, one important point I want to add here is that uh, in the traditional uh, environment, like in the past, our analysis was generally limited to three realities in transfer We call them as economic reality, legal reality, financial reality, which means if I have an LRD, which is a low risk distributor, and if that's an LRD, and it has got substance, required substance, so I call that as LRD, no problem. But then from a legal reality perspective, I say that uh, it's again LRD and agreement clearly says, intercompany agreement clearly defines various terms and conditions in the contract and those define that entity as LRD. But when I look at financial reality, that LRD is incurring losses. So there's clearly uh, this clear discrepancy here uh, that three realities are not matching. But when I move to post bets model, especially when I'm looking at value chain analysis, where are the key value drivers? And when I say key value drivers, then the next question is who's actually contributing to, to, to those key value drivers? And there, the role of corporate governance is very important. Yeah. And there's a concept which we keep discussing uh, for our clients is RACI concept. And which is, who's responsible for such decisions? Who's accountable? Who's controlling those decisions? Who should be informed? So if we have a board, and that board uh, has gives a lot of authority to LRD, right? Yeah. And so they say that uh, from, uh, from operating model, that's an LRD. But they're actually giving a lot of responsibility to the to the senior people, to senior people in LRD, and because of that, the, the when we look at the, the pricing model, the pricing model, the TP model is uh, leading to uh, uh, a kind of uh, routine return. But because those people in LRD, they they are taking uh, significant decisions. Because of that, the principal is incurring losses. So there is clear disconnect between corporate governance, operating model, and finance. Tax TP model. Yeah. So it's very important for us to revisit such those models and apply VCA techniques to find where the loopholes are, and so that we can correct those loopholes. So, so to 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 put it this in other words, that the holistic approach is very very important now. It's just not only looking at three realities. We also have to look at corporate governance and what's the operating business model of the group. Yeah, absolutely, Sirena. And as part of then the value chain analysis in, the, in these situations, you can use the RACI matrix and in the views uh, at the same time, and then, then the, the misalignment or alignment will be reflected. All right, when to apply value chain analysis? Well, it gives you the tools to understand better the allocation of profits and losses to the different activities and functions and see which parts of your value of your business really take the case. Therefore, value chain analysis can be a starting point for an effective communication with tax authorities and speed up resolution of disputes with tax authorities. Um, value chain analysis can also, as we saw, uh, serve the assessment of your best risk and uh, it tells the story about your business for your master part. Um, it, value chain analysis can support your tax and transfer pricing strategies in getting more tax efficient and improve your transfer pricing model. Uh, value, uh, it, it gives you also the chance to tell your story because this is all very company specific and enables you to maintain a high level of profit in the long run in a, in a sustainable way. Um, so sometimes when you should consider the value chain analysis uh, as part of your batch readiness assessment. Um, we have a list of four of them. And you have not yet finalized your master file approach to presenting your value chain, value drivers, and value creating activities. Um, your draft country by country reporting uh, template reflects some deviations. Uh, between the allocation of your profit and the allocation of your value creation function. Um, you are still working to articulate what are the value drivers of your business. 
um, and, and if you compare with with the competitive advantage that, that, that there are um, uh, discrepancies and also uh, you may consider value chain analysis um, when the um, when your company value drivers are mainly based on internal data without closely considering industry development and how competitors are acting. Yeah, regulatory. Um, then the, the regulatory background. Um, uh, the, it obviously uh, anchored in several OECD references. Um, we have seen uh, the uh, strategy on development document uh, where the concept of global value change was already adopted by the OECD Council in May 2012. Um, also in, in, in that section it depends, the OECD embraces the global value chain concept. And recently we had the uh, discussion draft on revised guidance, revised guidance on public goods in July of this year. And there, the OECD further emphasized the PCA approach for MEs, and also emphasized um, the, the whole holistic value chain analysis. Um, um, in the revised guidance on profit split, uh, the OECD gave the following guidance about the purpose of a PCA um, in section 154. And there it says a value chain analysis undertaken as part of the broad-based analysis of the tax base circumstances may be useful in helping to identify when the transactional profit split method may be appropriate. Such an analysis may also assist in determining how the method, if indeed it is the most appropriate method, should be applied, including the profits to be split and the relevant splitting factors. There are already examples of countries that started to introduce value chain analysis in their local laws. Uh, there's the guidance from the Chinese tax authorities, for example. Um, recently, the China State Administration of Taxation introduced it in June of this year in Notice 42. Um, and the requirements for transatlantic disclosure and documentation in this notice include 22 related party transaction forms including CYC reporting and the three tiers of transfer pricing documentation of not about local files and specific uh, local documentation. And furthermore, Notice 42 also includes a lot of requirements for value chain analysis in the local file. Um, and, and all this um, should be coupled with the annual financial statements of the, of, the, of the group entities and uh, measurement and attribution of value creation contributed by location specific factors and allocation policies and actual allocation results of the group profit in the global value chain. This all should be disclosed to the Chinese tax authority. Another country that is already active on value chain analysis is Germany. And, um, the German Ministry of Finance already issued a notification back in April 2005 that the value added contribution of the taxpayer is often not visible in a function and risk analysis in the financial pricing documentation. This is the traditional functional analysis, and therefore the taxpayer must submit a description of the relevant value chain in order to determine the value proportion of the individual group entity in the total value. Of Thanks, Marci. Uh, now, in the next slide, we have uh, we have three layer of documentation, uh, and we say master file, C by C R, and tax return. But I would say that in today's environment, we have five layers of documentation where we will also add local file and. Uh, and uh, I will also add local forms. And for for a tax inspector, the initial documents which they will be looking at to decide uh, on taking uh, the audit uh, case is will basically be uh, country by country reporting and uh, tax return. That is, they will be the initial documents which they will be looking at to form their judgment. And 
The challenge now for the MNEs is that any disclosure if made in one document, if that doesn't tie up with the disclosure made in another document, that MNE will face significant challenges, right? And when we look at value chain analysis, that value chain analysis can help us in aligning all five layer of documentation, uh, which is master file, C by C R, tax return, local forms, and local files. Now, uh, one example I can highlight here is that we can have a case where in C by C R we have uh, uh, we have a, an entity which has a, a few employees, but uh, high level of profits. And when we look at master file, master file has a value chain uh, analysis is there, a broad value chain analysis, how much profits in each report part of the value chain. And when we look at that, we we the inspector can uh, form a conclusion that the value chain uh, where this legal entity is playing a role is not creating so much value. So this legal entity, which is getting a lot of profits, which are reflected in C by C R, and it has a few employees, and it is not it's not contributing a lot to to the value chain. That means those profits are high, and this these profits will be challenged by the tax inspector in another in location, where the entity in that location is party to the intercompany transaction with this uh, local entity where we have a lot of profits with few employees. So one has to really align the information provided in these different uh, layer of documentation and that can be done appropriately by applying value chain analysis tools. So on the live slide we have few takeaways and there can be uh, many more takeaways but for our discussion purpose today we have listed some important takeaways here. The first and the foremost thing is that in today's environment they, the world is moving towards full tax transparency. Because of media coverage, because the way information flows, information is available through various media sources and we have already seen examples in, in the past like Panama leak paper papers we had, we had uh, 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 another leaks which happened in the past in, in relation to Luxembourg and we already have EU directive which requires different countries in Europe to exchange information on tax ruling and we are already getting requests from tax authorities to provide information for our clients, our clients are getting requests. So information it will be available just on a click of of, of, a, of a button and the the tax inspector in all these jurisdictions can access the information so if if a taxpayer is earning more profit without substance the other country can easily challenge it. Secondly, it's the taxable income is what is earned by the local entity has to match with people's function so those days have gone now where we have board of directors and they come and they visit the local country and they take certain decisions and they go back. We need to have people, uh, people function. We need to have people on their payroll. And it's just not only number of people. We need to, we need to have people with capability. What title they carry? Do they have a lot of experience? Are they adding value to the business or not? So that level of discussion. So it's not just only people function in terms of number of people. It's significant people function will be key now. And one, on one angle we see that uh, these all are requirements and the expert has to comply. But at the same time we see there will be increased, uh, increased, increasing litigation, especially from countries, for example, from emerging markets where the local entity is uh, doing a lot of marketing and selling. And we have already seen disputes in countries like, like India, China, where local authorities are expecting a bigger share in, in the profit in the value chain because they are claiming that a lot of advertising, marketing, and promotional uh, functions are performed by local entity. And in certain cases, they're claiming that instead of uh, the local entity paying royalty back to the IP, the IP company should pay the royalty back to the local entity. So because of this action 8 to 10, we will see increased level of litigation. So it will be important for MNEs to, to document 
their intercompany pricing policy through uh, proper value chain analysis that can actually help the M&E in mitigating uh, TP risk uh, during audit. And, and BAPS has already triggered some tax authorities to, uh, uh, to attack ag aggressive tax structuring, which we have already seen uh, done by Australian Tax Office. And as my colleague Margie, she, she shared that uh, in China, the Chinese tax authorities are expecting full value chain disclosure uh, in, in uh, local country documentation. So the key message here is that the companies, they need to check their value, they need to understand their value chain, they need to understand where are the key value drivers in the value chain and which legal entities performing uh, those functions which are creating those value, value drivers and which those legal entities have, what level of people they have, are they senior people, what title they carry, what level of function they carry, are they significant people. So all that analysis will be very important uh, in today's environment to ensure that uh, each legal entity in the group which is party to the intercompany transaction is rewarded appropriately for its functionality. So with this, uh, we end our session. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, we are more than happy to, to answer now. You can type them in the, in the chat box. We have not seen uh, any questions so far. Uh, Maji, there is one question, and the question is that: uh, uh, Does this uh, value chain analysis uh, lead to a higher compliance cost for the taxpayer? Uh, my answer to this is that we have to evaluate evaluate cost in terms of benefits. Yeah. Yes, sure uh, doing value chain analysis will definitely invite hours, uh, invite time costs from professionals, and also from from uh, finance people, tax people in the in the M&E, but at the same time, the benefits are far higher because it helps one mitigating TP risk, second com in complying with the documentation requirements, and third and the foremost is aligning corporate governance, yeah. operating model, and TP model. So it directs business in the in the right direction, yeah. so that. The rewards which are given to the various legal entities is based on commercial decision. It's based on what value they are bringing to the value chain. And it also offers the opportunity on the other side to become more efficient and to, to protect your or to improve your profitability in a, in a, a compliant way in the long run. So you should, I think, distinguish between the short term and the long run. Beneficial to have your your structure uh, compliant, future proof. So to speak. Uh, there's another question, uh, and that question is uh, uh, the question is that are tax authorities in Europe they are asking the, about tax really in, in a specific format uh, ex under exchange of information? Yeah. yeah, within the EU, there is a template that should be used especially for CYC reporting and it should be uh, filed and submitted in, in, a, in a certain format. Okay, thanks. So we don't have any more questions, so uh, with this we end today's session. If you have any questions, you can drop us an email uh, or you can uh, go to our website and uh, uh, the presentation and recording uh, will be available in a few days, so if you want to revisit this presentation, you can check this uh, next week. And with this, uh, we thank you for your time, and we will be coming back with the next presentation in this series of Alice. Yes. Thanks again, and thanks everyone. Thank you for your attendance.